It now gives me great pleasure to introduce one of the most popular sessions we feature at this event every year. Professor Ian Harper joins us to share his expert insight on the state of the national and global economies. It's important to note that Ian is not speaking on behalf of the Reserve Bank of Australia today, despite being a board member. Ian, welcome to the Aon Insight series and over to you. Well, thank you, Jason, for that warm welcome and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's just terrific to be back with you all again. Uh, the Aon Insight series is as much a highlight for me uh, each year as it is for many of you I know. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me back, Jason. Last time uh, I spoke to you last year, we were in the midst of the worst downturn since the Great Depression. And at the time, I said to you that um, while things were pretty tough, uh, there were two key differences between our experience this time through the pandemic induced recession and what happened in the Great Depression. Now, one of them was that this was a supply side phenomenon rather than demand side. In other words, there was a supply restriction essentially imposed by the need to limit human movement and human interaction. And once that was lifted, then we would expect the economy to return pretty quickly to its original state, if not better. So supply side rather than demand side. And the second thing, very importantly, is that the financial system both here in Australia and globally, has been part of the solution and not part of the problem. Now, those of you who know anything about the Great Depression, of course, would understand that the collapse of the banking system really reinforced the downdraft of the Great Depression and made it as deep and as long as it was. This time we haven't had that problem because the financial system is sound. So we start from a strong base. We're now 12 months further on. We've come through the worst economically of this uh, recession, and with the advent of vaccines and the wider distribution, frankly, the outlook is very strong indeed. So there's an elevator version of what I need to um, convey to you this morning. And let's begin by talking about the global economy. And then we'll get on to talking about the Australian economy. So first, the global. OK. Now, what you're looking at here, ladies and gentlemen, is a series of bars which represent the growth uh, at different points in time of different countries that you can see across the uh, bottom of the chart there. So the different colours, uh, the light green, let me just give you a draw here. Uh, the light green there is the average, uh, in this case, for China of growth in GDP over the past 10 years. Then you can see the colours moving to the right. The dark green for 2019 is an actual, and the light blue is 2020. 2021 is still a forecast, of course, because we're still yet to have all the data in for 2021. And then finally, the sort of greeny blue on the end of the bars uh, is our forecast for 2022. Now, when I say our forecast, these charts have been prepared by my colleagues at Deloitte Access Economics. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge Chelsea Boone, who's in the audience this morning, uh, who helped me put these charts together. So the data are from Deloitte Access Economics, as Jason mentioned, I have the privilege of serving on the Bank, uh, Reserve Bank of Australia board, uh, but I'm not giving you Reserve Bank forecasts this morning. Uh, I will talk a little bit about some scenarios later on that are based in Reserve Bank data, but they are public forecasts. So back to the chart, you can see for each of these countries, obviously 2020 is only too evident. Big negatives in the growth in these different countries, including ourselves, uh, as the pandemic took a grip but as I said, it's been a supply side phenomenon. In other words, it's like somebody standing on a pipe. As soon as you put your foot off the pipe, the flow continues once more. In this instance, taking our foot off has been about vaccines. It's about removing the need for us to be completely isolated, which has affected the international economy and domestic economies, most especially through the services sector, as we'll see, but affected it quite dramatically. Once you take away that restriction, uh, by uh, vaccinating and inoculating large proportions of the population, as we've certainly been doing here in Australia, uh, then you can see a quick recovery. So here in Australia's case, in the middle of the chart where my arrow is pointing, you can see our forecast for 2021 and then an even stronger 2022. Now, that pattern is broadly speaking repeated elsewhere across the chart. In some cases, because of the depth, for example, in the UK economy, uh, you can see here that we've got a much quicker uh, recovery in the case of the UK forecast, simply because of the depth of the downturn in the first place. 
back again to China, you'll notice that they never really had negative growth. Uh, and the growth outlook in China, if anything, for their purposes, looks like being a little weaker. There are other things going on in China that we won't necessarily address today, but that explains where that's happening. Uh, the United States, as you can see, again, forecast for strong growth both for this year and for the next, and the same is true of the eurozone on the right of the chart. So the pattern is the same in each case. We've had a short, sharp, deep recession from which we've recovered strongly, and it's basically V-shaped, as I was suggesting to you last year that it might have been. And one of the reasons for that is that this whole phenomenon has been essentially uh, a result of the services sector being constrained by the inability of people to gather and by restrictions on people's movements. To be frank, the goods part of the economy, and this chart here, as you can see, refers to the production of goods as opposed to services, again across this range of countries, the US, Japan, Eurozone, UK and China, uh, this chart is just showing you year-to-year -year growth in industrial production across these different countries, again with some forecasts from my colleagues at Lloyd Access Economics on the right-hand side of the chart. Broadly speaking, you see that the good side of the international economy powered through this phenomenon. Uh, it was the same for us with respect to exports of commodities. Uh, you know, basically, may, most of our commodity exports, particularly iron ore and coal, heavily mechanised, in the case of coal, often the ships themselves are docked from a great distance. Certainly the trains and the trucks are operated remotely. And then when all the um, ore is placed on the ship, the ship might have at most, say, 14 hands, uh, and they're at sea for a couple of weeks themselves. So our iron ore exports, our coal exports, they were not affected by this phenomenon. They were restricted by other things, but not by what happened with the pandemic. And that's more broadly speaking true of goods production right the way through. So goods production carried on, which is another reason why the recession wasn't as deep as it might, might otherwise have been, and certainly not as long. Uh, once we remove the restrictions on the, on the services side of the economy, then rapidly we see some recovery uh, in the offing, as you can see. Another reason that we've had a very strong recovery, obviously, is that there has been significant undergirding support from fiscal and monetary authorities around the world. This is another difference between our experience this time and what happened in the 1930s. Uh, in the 1930s, basically, you know, monetary policy hadn't been uh, invented. And uh, governments in those days uh, believed that you handled all of this by tightening uh, the purse strings, not by loosening the purse strings. That revolution in thought needed John Maynard Keynes to publish his book, the general theory of interest, uh, employment and money. Uh, but that didn't happen until 1936 in essentially the aftermath or in some countries, uh, the depths of the Great Depression. Well, all that, um, here we are nearly uh, a century on, and you find that our way of thinking about things has changed quite dramatically. So in response to these so sorts of developments, you had a rapid demand side public policy response from both monetary policy and fiscal policy. Now, I do note that these are essentially demand instruments, like lowering interest rates, uh, spending money is about stimulating demand. Uh, when you've got a restriction which is based on the supply side of the economy, as this one was, it can take some time to actually work. Uh, it can't obviously address the supply side restriction itself because it's got nothing to do with economic demands. It's a health restriction. But once that list is lifted, you get an enormous pent-up demand that is pushed rapidly on by the fact that monetary policy and fiscal policy have been so stimulatory throughout the period. Well, you can see that even before the pandemic, and here we're looking at roughly this part of the chart over here, you can see that even before the pandemic set in, interest rates were very low as we were seeking to try and stimulate particularly inflation and to some extent growth in economies around the world. Then came the pandemic, and all of this was simply extended. So low interest rates, you can see here. Now, these, again, are forecasts from Deloitte Access Economics. So let me emphasize, since I'm talking about interest rates, these are not official forecasts. Uh, these are numbers which are essentially backed out of market expectations, futures prices and such like, which give you some basis on which to forecast interest rates out in the future. Effectively, this is what the market thinks. This is what people who've got money on these questions actually believe, at least in aggregate, uh, because they're prepared to put money behind these bets. Anyway, what you can see is across the range of countries represented in the chart, again, 
you can see that we've got negative uh, interest rates in Europe for some particular uh, period of time still ahead of us. And in the other countries, well, that's also true, incidentally, of the UK, which you can see in green, slightly negative rates out into the future. And then for the rest of the countries, you can see very, very low interest rates until we get out beyond 2024. Now, those of you who follow Reserve Bank pronouncements will know that the governor of the Reserve Bank, Dr Philip Lowe, uh, has pointed out that, um, uh, in his view, uh, the bank won't be raising interest rates until early 2024. Uh, these rates aren't actually the cash rates. These are market rates, but they're linked to decisions about the cash rate. And you can see in our own case here, which is this green uh, line just there, that the market is sort of saying, well, if that's going to be the case, uh, we might want to see interest rates move a little bit earlier. The market is pulling a little bit earlier than we think at the bank. Uh, but nevertheless, by the time we get to 2024, uh, we've got interest rates basically rising again. Now, that's a market forecast, as I say, not a bank forecast. But for the next year or two, you can expect interest rates to be pretty much where they are and for continued support of monetary policy. The same is true of fiscal policy. This doesn't show you a timeline. It just shows you the extent of fiscal support. Uh, here we are in Australia, having spent uh, over 15% of GDP one way or another in supporting the Australian economy through the pandemic experience. Uh, you'll note that we aren't uh, right at the top of this particular league table. There are other countries there represented in the chart which have spent a good deal more than we have in stimulating the economy, and the notable one, obviously, here is the United States. Uh, you might wonder why China is so low. Well, as you saw in the first chart, China didn't experience anything like the downturn that we experienced, and so it wasn't as necessary for the Chinese government to support the economy. But even in China, uh, there has been an increase in fiscal support to ensure the Chinese economy makes its way through the pandemic as well. There were significant reductions in consumption in China because, of course, people movements in China were also restricted during the pandemic, as you'd be aware. So let's now move... Uh, well, I want to show you one more chart before we go to domestically. Uh, let's this chart here. You often hear people say that um, the lockdowns weren't as necessary and that we've imposed unnecessary hardship on the economy. Uh, nobody liked the lockdowns, least of all me, and not to say keeping from coming from Melbourne, uh, the world's longest lockdown. It's been an unpleasant experience all around. Uh, and I speak as somebody, fortunately, who hasn't caught the virus but uh, or lost a loved one. And, uh, you know, for many of us here in Melbourne, as it's true elsewhere in the world, of course, and around Australia, uh, these have been very sobering times. And, um, you know, I certainly feel for those people who've either suffered from it themselves or lost loved ones through this process. I mean, it's been a pandemic, right? It's not anything to joke about. But the idea that if we had simply here in Australia been much more relaxed about managing people movements, much less concerned about lockdowns and constraints, that we would have had nowhere near the economic impact that we've had, that idea, folks, is, is not supported by the data. So this chart simply does a simple line plot and in there you can see there's a weak uh, negative correlation there. I'm not going to make too much of it, but it heads in that direction rather than the other direction. Those countries that were less concerned opened up earlier, didn't manage the lockdowns quite as severely as we did on the left-hand side of the chart. You can see that those countries, at least on average, have had a more negative experience when it comes to deviation in GDP per capita since December 2019. In other words, the economic impact towards the right of the chart has actually been bigger in terms of the negative effect, effect on per capita income. On the right-hand side of the chart, where you see ourselves and the Kiwis are up here, these are the countries that have really gotten tough when it comes to people movements and lockdowns and such like. You see that the economic impact on us per capita is almost imperceptible, uh, and the New, Zealand have, New Zealanders have actually done quite well, uh, for at least until recent times, with the economy locked down. So I just want to make the point that the simple argument that, you know, we made a wrong turn when we chose lockdowns, uh, and I'm not going to debate the severity of lockdowns. That's really not my field. But just the general proposition that if we let things fly, if we just said, you know, hang it all, we'll just go on, on, on with our business and moved ourselves across to this side of the chart over here towards the right, uh, it simply isn't true that the economic impact would have been a whole lot lower than it was. And those are not based on models or propositions or people's theories or ideologies uh, these are data which are um, compiled. You can see here on the right of the chart where we've got the data from. 
essentially WHO and IMF to compile that chart. Again, I give my thanks to my colleagues at DAE for compiling that chart for us. Well, enough on the global economy. Let's talk about Australia now, more narrowly. Now, on this chart, you'll see our growth again uh, up here. You see GDP with the four bars uh, and the different years mentioned along the bottom of the chart here. So the light green is 2019, the dark green 2020, the light blue 2021, and the dark blue 2022 forecasts. Uh, for the, the bottom line, if you like, GDP, you can see again 2019, small positive, 2020, big negative, uh, 2021, strong recovery. In fact, on these figures here, growth for the year year on for that 2021 coming out of the, of the bottom, so right up to the top, is growth in excess of 5%. And then settling back again in 2022, but still uh, well north of 3 to 3.5% in 2022. Uh, again, these are DAE forecasts, Lloyd Access Economics forecasts. When you look further down the chart here, what you'll see is the different components of that growth. So how is that actually made up? And what I'd like to draw your attention to, uh, firstly, uh, here is exports that we'll see uh, a, a weaker recovery in exports this year in forecast, but in 2022, very strong um, recovery in exports. The difference there is essentially that we've not been doing much in the way of exporting services at all during the lockdown. And I speak as somebody who works in the education sector. Uh, the closure of the international border, I don't need to tell you, is decimated our international student business. And, um, uh, you know, tertiary education in a state like Victoria, where I come from, was our largest services export by a long shot. In fact, it's our largest export by value because we don't have a large commodity base here in Victoria. Similarly, tourism also knocked around. Now, as the international border reopens, you can expect to see services come back on stream as a source of exports. And services exports are about 25% of total exports. So to bring them back on stream will uh, give us a much stronger growth in exports in 2022. Not earlier than that, because we're not expecting the border to be open, uh, at least not for international students coming and going, until early next year. The other thing I'd draw your attention to at the bottom of the chart is consumption. Uh, the reason economists talk about consumption growth is that consumption is about 60% of output. So as goes... Uh, Consumption, there goes GDP, broadly speaking. And you can see during the downturn, consumption took a real hit, notwithstanding the fact that uh, people had income. It's another difference of this recession because of things like JobKeeper. People's incomes were sustained. They kept their jobs, they kept being paid, and their incomes went up. What they did with the income, though, was to spend, uh, to save it, which is a very sensible thing to do. Put it into mortgages, save it in banks, put it under the bed, whatever. They didn't spend it. And while it's very good for household financial security, so what we didn't have was a wave of forced sales of houses, people being tossed out of house and home because they couldn't meet their mortgage repayments. Mercifully, that didn't happen uh, because people's incomes stayed up. But they didn't consume. That's going to be reversed both this year and next year as people wear off that enormous bank of savings that they've been building up. Uh, and that bank of savings is what's going to shoot us out the other side in particular to strong growth in GDP that you can see here. Um, only other thing I'd like to point out to you is that business investment has turned around. Business investment has been weak for quite some time, even before the pandemic. And there's a lot of discussion about why business ex um, expenditure or capital expenditure or business investment has been weak. We're expecting some turnaround as conditions improve, uh, which is what you would hope for and expect. We'd like to see more, but it hasn't. Uh, turned up just yet. They're going to need to be policy changes we expect to drive business investment. Next chart shows us what we're expecting to occur with uh, unemployment, wages growth and inflation. You look at the top left hand side of the chart here. This line chart shows you what we're expecting for the unemployment rate. We're sort of around about here at the moment. Uh, so unemployment, yes, uh, has gone up clearly as a result of the slowdown in the economy is coming back down again as we recover and the forecasts are for unemployment to come right back down to the natural rate, about 4.5%, uh, and then possibly kick up a little bit. When the unemployment rate comes down and the economy starts to recover, people move back into the labour force. 
the participation rate rises. And as that rises, the first effect of that is for unemployment to go up. And then as people take the jobs, it comes back down again, you can see. So in forecast, we're expecting unemployment to recover back towards what economists refer to as full employment uh, in the very near future. Difficulty is that it doesn't expect to do an awful lot for wages growth. So wages growth looks like it's still going to languish at around 2%, possibly a little bit higher out towards 2024, but not much happening with wages growth, even though unemployment is down towards the full employment level of unemployment, or to put it more correctly, uh, the economy is fully employed. So what put those two things together, and you get the right-hand side of the chart, which shows you that uh, even though we've had a spike in inflation, that you can see up here, a spike in CPI growth, essentially as a result of shortages and blockages and the coming off of various administrative price restrictions on things like childcare, we're expecting the steady state rate of inflation pretty quickly to come back down again. This uh, grey bar across the middle of the chart is the Reserve Bank's target range for inflation of four to of 2 to 3% uh, on average across the cycle. Uh, you can see that inflation just sneaks its way back in to the Reserve Bank's target range again by about 2024. Uh, there you are. And that's uh, you know no coincidence that the governor talks about that uh, 2024 as an operative date. These are forecasts again from Deloitte Access Economics, but they come to the same conclusion that inflation doesn't look like it's going to creep back into the target range even, let alone beyond, until 2024. Reason for that is weak wages growth. Reason for weak wages growth, well, thereby hangs a long tail. Not time for that today, but no outlook for strong inflation. Uh, you might be wondering, are there no effects of the most recent lockdowns? This chart just breaks that out for you and says clearly, yes, the light green line shows you, well, let's start actually with the other two lines. They show you where the forecasts were in December of 2019, March of 2021, and then the light green line shows you September of 2021. So did the lockdowns, most recently in New South Wales and Victoria, have an impact? You betcha. Pushed us right off course. We'll recover as the vaccine ratios have gone up. We'll make a rapid recovery in uh, to next year, which is that strong recovery bar you saw in the earlier chart, and then put us back on track more or less for where we were by September of 2022. So there's a bit of a detour as we say, the um, recovery has been delayed by the lockdowns, but it has not been derailed. It's just a bit of a detour as to how we're going to tackle that over the next year or two. So strong growth in prospect. People talk about interest rates and what the Reserve Bank might do. Again, down the bottom here are some forecasts. These have come from the market itself in dark blue, the ASX 30-day interbank cash rate. So these are market forecasts. Again, as you know, the Reserve Bank has said it won't move the cash rate until 2024. The market thinks that will happen a bit easier, a bit earlier than that. Well, then let's see. But what are interest rates likely to do over the next 12 months to 18 months? Uh, then these forecasts would suggest, off the back of modest inflation, that interest rates aren't going anywhere fast, whether you take three-year rates, the cash rate, or estimates of the cash rate. This chart makes the point I was making earlier on that the impact of the pandemic has essentially been on the services sector. Here on the right-hand side of the chart, you've got the services sector arrayed, and you can see these forecasts, the light blue 2020 actuals. Again, uh, the darker colour here, 2021 forecast, dark blue, and the greeny blue of 2022 next to it. So on the right-hand side of the chart, you've got all of these different services, accommodation and food, transport, administration, all suffering a very deep downturn because of the restrictions on people's movements. And then up here, you can see a rapid recovery on the services side. The goods part of the economy over this way towards the left, uh, wholesale trade, clearly the mining sector, even manufacturing, but not particularly much affected. And over here, we get to our own sector, finance and insurance. That's this one here. You can see that there's not much impact of the pandemic at all. Roared straight through broad straight through. And over here is the farm sector, which has had particular uh, climate effects that have meant they've had a very strong season, so the farm sector is doing well as well. You know, the lesson from this chart is that as the service sector recovers, the pattern across the economy will be a whole lot easier and a whole lot more even than it has been through the recession. Let me come now to the three scenarios that uh, Jason mentioned at the outset. Now, these scenarios have been produced by the Reserve Bank. They're published 
in the Reserve Bank's statement of monetary policy, so I'm not revealing any secrets here necessarily. Uh, but it's important, I think, that we take a look at these charts. Oops, let me just do this. There we go. Now, these three scenarios, you can see the green line in the middle is what the Reserve Bank calls the baseline forecast. That's where we would have expected to go when these forecasts were drawn up uh, in August. Then the green line is where we expected to go on average. And then on either side was a downside and an upside, as you can see. Well, basically, as the note points out, once we got stuck into the lockdowns in New South Wales and Victoria, this was post the development of the forecasts, uh, it was reasonably clear that what we were doing was now tracking the downside forecast. So this dark green line is more or less where we've been since these forecasts and scenarios were produced as a result of the lockdowns. But as the lockdowns have eased, firstly in New South Wales and now mercifully in Victoria, uh, we've seen economic activity pick up again. So my expectation is that we will travel much closer to the Reserve Bank's midline here or baseline forecast. Uh, we'll get back to that pretty quickly. So again, the story is a detour, a detour down to the downside and then a return to the, up, to the uh, baseline. Uh, will we see the upside? I doubt it very much. I don't think the recovery is quite that strong. But let's not get too despondent here. This midline or baseline uh, forecast is pretty encouraging out over the next couple of years. That's for output. Uh, the same story broadly you can see for unemployment. Again, a downside and an upside. And what we've been observing is that we've had less... Um, we followed the baseline less than we'd expected to do. Uh, we're actually following the downside scenario, so unemployment has been rising. But it will quickly come off again, particularly as we recover, uh, and then we'd expect to go back down again towards the midline. Uh, again, a detour for unemployment. Unemployment's very hard to read in these circumstances because people tend to leave the labour force, particularly with income support, and as they leave the labour force, uh, that confuses the measures of unemployment, makes them lower than they might otherwise be. If you were to include all the people who'd left the labour force as a result of the lockdowns, then these lines would be a whole lot higher, probably even higher still, right up here. But they quickly turn. As the economy recovers, people come back into the labour force and unemployment comes back down again. And the last chart is a chart of inflation. Again, these are Reserve Bank numbers based on Reserve Bank scenarios, upside and the downside. Uh, inflation, as you saw before, has been stubbornly low, primarily because of the low growth of wages. There's been quite a lot of talk, though, about inflation taking off, and in particular about interest rates rising and backing inflation in. Can I tell you that even if you look at long interest rates, so 10-year interest rates, which is where you would expect the inflation effect, if it's really going to take off, to show up, is it true that long bond rates have risen? The answer is yes. And how much have they risen? Well, in some cases, you know, 50, 80, sometimes 100 basis points. Uh, does that take those long interest rates, in our case in Australia, uh, back above or into and beyond the Reserve Bank's target range for inflation? Well, the answer is no. The answer is no. And if you take out of those long bond rates the expectation of what the market thinks inflation is going to be, it is still within the Reserve Bank's target range in 10 years' time. So will there be a pickup in inflation? The answer is yes. Will that be hyperinflation? I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I don't see that. And the market doesn't see that. The people who've got money on that don't see that. What they see is inflation rising back into the target range. And that's precisely where the Reserve Bank wants to see it. When that happens, we'll see interest rates back up again to more normal levels. And we'll know that we've put the worst behind us. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ian, for that fantastic uh, both local and global overview uh, of, uh, of what's happening with the economy as a result of COVID. Um, Ian, we do have time for a couple of questions, actually. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to ask a couple of those questions. Um, and the first, uh, the first question really is, of those three scenarios that you covered, and this has really been a hallmark of your presentation every year, you, you mm -hmm. always cover some scenario analysis. Of the three scenarios that we just covered, which one do you consider to be the most likely and why? Yeah, thanks, Jace. Uh, it's important to put scenarios up because 
the future is near so uncertain that if I just give you a single forecast, that's pretty unreliable. And, and you know, the Reserve Bank says the same thing most economists do. Uh, in short, Jason, we'll follow the downside scenario for a little while yet, and then we'll return back, I think, to the baseline. So really, the upside scenario, which at one point there, when we drew up the scenarios, we thought was quite likely because we were roaring out of that downturn. But then with the latest lockdowns, whack, back down to, to earth we came. So downside to begin with, and then a recovery to a baseline scenario. But as I indicated, that baseline is pretty encouraging. Right. Thank you, Ian. And uh, just another, another question. Before the pandemic hit, there were fears of a global recession, Ian. Has COVID merely delayed an inevitable downturn? What's your view on that? Yeah, I don't believe that at all. I don't think there's any evidence of a global downturn in prospect. And put it this way, if there was, uh, we have thrown so much of this, not just in Australia, but around the world. I saw my charts earlier on in terms of increasing fiscal support and monetary support uh, that the prospect of a global downturn, I think, is extremely remote. Now, could it happen? I can't say never. Uh, if it were to happen, it would be the result of other developments that have occurred primarily in China. The Chinese are doing their very best to manage uh, the exuberance in the property market, if I can put it that way, uh, while uh, not dampening the Chinese economy so drastically that they induce the type of global recession that someone here might have thought would occur. Uh, so if it were to happen, I think that would be the channel. Uh, I don't think it's likely because the Chinese have a lot of weaponry to deal with all aspects of what they're struggling with in the property market, uh, but spillover effects and expectations could occur. But I would say that the maintained outlook is no. With a degree of fiscal support, recovery and strength and growth in the economy, there isn't any prospect of a downturn that I can see. Great. Fantastic, Ian. Thank you. Um, and Ian, it's, it's always a great pleasure to have you to join us for our annual event. As I mentioned before, your session is always voted one of our most popular. We really appreciate your contribution you make to uh, the event every year. So thank you for joining us today and providing uh, expert insight onto the state of the national and global economies. Um, highly informative, Ian, hugely interesting. So thank you very much. It's my great pleasure, Jason. Thanks for having me. Best wishes, everyone. Thank you.